Welcome to A Woman's Clarity, a podcast that empowers financial professionals to better connect with and serve their female clients. Listen in as host Kirsten Schlumbaum, Vice President of Annuity Sales at C2P, and her guests help you speak the language of women clients and meet their unique financial needs and goals. Welcome back to A Woman's Clarity. I'm Kirsten Schlumbaum, host, and I'm excited and fascinated with our next guest, Amy Colton, the CEO and founder of Your Divorce Made Simple. Now, that almost sounds like an oxymoron to say that your divorce is made simple, but somehow, some way, she makes it happen. So, Amy, welcome to A Woman's Clarity. Thank you. I'm happy to have you here. Can you share with us, since it is a fascinating subject, can you give us your background on who you are and what you currently do at Your Divorce Made Simple? So, I am... First and foremost, I'm a financial advisor. And when I, when I started my financial practice, I wanted to support women, especially women going through major life transitions. And three of the biggest major life transitions that happen for women are death of a loved one, divorce, and, and retirement. And all three of those need financial planning because your life is changing. Okay. you you know, you, your spouse dies, your life changes. You got divorced, your life changes. You go through retirement, your life changes. So all three of these really require financial planning when these things happen. And I always say this, all my clients are women. This isn't my financial practice. Just some of them come attached to a man. But I say that because I wanted to make sure that women were part of the conversation, that they got their questions answered. And I didn't want it being um, a lot of times a man will talk to the man and leave a woman completely out of the conversation. And that was not my intent when I started doing this. I, I came from a very male dominated industry, which was the technology industry. And I ended up in a male dominated industry, which is the financial services industry. So I really wanted, as a woman financial advisor, I just wanted to make sure that the women who were my clients got educated, got their questions answered, were part of the conversation and they weren't left behind. Uh, what, at the same time I started the practice, I also met a family law attorney who didn't want to do divorce anymore because it was too stressful. And she started sending her clients to me and say, hey, if you can work things out with Amy, you can come back to me and I'll write the paperwork, I'll file the divorce paperwork and I'll write the divorce decree. So when I started doing that for these clients that she was sending me, I started realizing that I could get this done a lot quicker than if two parties used lawyers and I could do it more cost efficiently, more time efficiently, and it was a way more amicable way to enter the divorce journey. And so now I've been doing this for many years. I really perfected the process that I take my clients through. I have a CDFA, which is a Certified Divorce Financial Analyst Certification, and I also have a Family Law Mediator Certification. So I've kind of combined the wealth management and the mediation together to create something I think is very unique. That's really fascinating. Now, you mentioned this wasn't where you started in, in your career path. So mm -hmm. before Divorce Made Simple, what did you go to school for? And are you like a lot of us, an accidental tourist in financial <laughs> services? <laughs> well, I, I, I must just say I'm a late bloomer. It took me a lot of years <laughs> to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. But I also believe that everything that I did before has helped me be better at what I'm doing today. So my, my journey, I actually got my master's degree. I got an MBA. And when I finished my MBA... <clears throat> I went to work for IBM and I worked in the technology industry for 25 years, the first 20 of which were at IBM. And I had two careers there. So I started out on the technical side of the business. I worked for the division of IBM that, that did hardware and software repair on mainframes. And in the 20 years I was there, we could have been a Fortune 500 just by ourselves, that division. But it went from that to non-existent because you think about it, your little iPhone 
has more capacity, it has more reliability, and it costs a hell of a lot less than those mainframes did back in the 70s when I started. <laughs> so that, as, as the hardware and software got more and more reliable over the years, that division went away. And, and when that was happening, it was before the word downsizing. So we didn't really know what was happening. We just knew our careers weren't going to go any further. So I switched over and be, went to sale, into sales. And so I've had spent the latter 10 years of my life at IBM in sales. And, and then I, I left IBM after 20 years and then went into telecom for about five more years and then decided I needed to do something totally different. So I went into, I, did, I went at night, I went to get my esthetician's license and I ended up working for a couple of firms selling products to physicians. And this was a time, it, this was in like the year 2000 where dermatologists and plastic surgeons were getting more focused on the aesthetics, not so much diseases like, for example, dermatologists focused on acne, but now they were focusing on anti-aging. And it was a huge paradigm shift going from being a medical practitioner to selling products to patients. And so what I would do is I would come in and talk to them about skincare products and anti-aging products and procedures that they would do in the office. And uh, the first company I worked for, I would, I would literally, they didn't know me. They didn't know the doctor that started. They didn't know the technologies. I was constantly knocking on doors. I was walking the streets of New York City, knocking on doors, meeting doctors for the first time. I taught pretty much every plastic surgeon and dermatologist in New York at that time how to do a chemical peel. It, it was, it was just. It was an interesting time. I spent about seven years in that industry, loved it. I did uh, the first couple, of, I worked for two companies where I was a salesperson and educator, and then I worked for one company where I was a sales manager. But then in 2008, I was working for a French company and they brought in a guy from Germany who wanted to clean up the bottom line and he fired everybody in management. It's 2008, I was out of a job. And I said to myself, I have to do something I'm passionate about and nobody is ever going to fire me for making too much money. And so it took me a while. It took me a couple of years to figure it out. But I ended up meeting someone through golf, of all things, and ended up uh, getting into the financial service industry. And the first two and a half years I was in the industry, I, I was at New York Life. It's not uncommon a lot for new advisors to start out that way and learn the insurance business. And then after I got all my licenses to be a financial advisor, I left to work with my uh, current business partner, Eric. And we've been together 10 years building the financial services practice. But at some point during the process, I got involved in doing a lot of divorce because there's a lot of financial planning that goes into divorce. And, and, that is what I focus on today. So I focus a lot on the financial and tax aspects of divorce. First off, wow, on the streets of New York, knocking on doors, cold calling, that's, that takes a lot of chutzpah. I mean, that's, that <laughs> made my stomach full that you did that, especially was it 10, 12 years ago, it was a different, really was a different place. So that yeah. takes a lot, a lot. But in your bio, you mention that you manage your life altering challenges because you understood you basically had to and how to manage your money, yet your friends going through the uh, similar situations did not. So how did you navigate, like you went through your own personal situation to get to where you are today. Do you mind maybe sharing a little bit about that and how you realized that you needed to well, be this advocate? Yeah, it's going through losing my job in 2008 was really hard. I mean, it, it was hard in a lot of ways because, A, I didn't anticipate it. I wasn't prepared for it mentally, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I ended up going back to work in the corporate world for a while, for about a year in that, in that two-year period, and I knew I couldn't stay. I knew that I had to do something on my own. I've been an entrepreneur now for 13 years. And believe me, it's not easy being an entrepreneur. It's not easy starting a business. And now I've started two from nothing. And there's just a lot of work 
that goes into doing it. And, and a lot of people, and I, that's why so many businesses fail. They don't, I don't, I think people who go into business for themselves really understand all the things you have to do and all the, I'm still learning every day. I mean, it's a, it's a journey. It's a journey. And fortunately I, I am, you know, a lifelong learner and always want to learn more. And, and I also, not only do I want to learn more, I want to share what I learned so other people don't have to make the same mistakes I make. And that, that's what I do a lot in the divorce work. A lot of it is when somebody's going through a divorce, they're going for it, through it for the first time. And they don't know a lot of what's realistic expectations. They don't know what questions to ask. And I work in the divorce arena every day. I see everybody's divorces and everyone's is different. And so I know I've seen the mistakes people make because lawyers make mistakes, clients make mistakes. I really try to help my clients don't make the same mistakes. So that's a big part of it. But years ago, I had a friend who was, I was still at IBM. This was a long time ago, but I had a friend who was in an unhappy marriage. She was not happy with her situation. She was not in love with her husband. They had two kids together. And she really wanted to get divorced, but she was scared that she could not live the same lifestyle post-divorce as she currently was living. And I thought, how sad to be in a situation like that. I'm very, very thankful that I've never felt like I was trapped in that kind of situation. And I want my clients not to be trapped in those kind of situations. But that, you know, I, I always remember that because personally, I've been through three divorces myself. And so, I mean, they were a long time ago, but, you know, the first one was extremely emotional, but I always knew, I, I always knew that I would be okay. I always had the confidence that I would be okay. And I think that's so important is to to, uh, to get educated, to have the confidence, to understand that you can be okay. And that's what I help my clients do. I really do. Because it's just as important for me to take them through the divorce journey is to make sure they're on a good path going forward. I was just thinking about you talking about the confidence because uh, the way I'm hearing you, I feel like you give your clients confidence to make that decision because it is hard. It's emotional. It's scary. And the way you're talking about it, if I were going through the situation and I approached you, I would feel confident because you would, I feel like you'd make, you make your clients feel confident. Yeah. I've dealt with all kinds of cases, but I think it's really important. Knowledge is what gives them confidence. And, and, and what I'm able to do is say, you know, here are the things that you can expect. So many people go into this with unrealistic expectations. I mean, Think about it. If you're getting divorced, you think, but most people think, oh, I need to hire an attorney. If you hire an attorney, your husband's going to hire an attorney. And now you've created a contentious situation because though that attorney is most likely going to want to get the best for their client. And 100% of the pie is not realistic. So, you know, somewhere between 60%. 50, 60% is realistic, but a lot of people don't understand that from the get-go. They think I'm entitled to this, or we, we were talking before about a guy who's, you know, my, saying my business is my business because I created it. Well, what about the woman who helped you create it, who stayed at home with the kids so you could create the business or, you know, contributed in some way for the last 40 years to you being successful in your business. Just because it's your business doesn't mean you get 100% of the pie. So how do you help your clients come understand their money situation? What strategies do you use so it doesn't become contentious? There's a lot of contentious situations. And I think most of the contention comes from people being unrealistic. And what I try to do is give them as much clarity as to what their estate looks like, what their expectations should be. And I use the analogy, not that we're going to go to court, but if we were going to co go to court, you need to understand how the judge might look at this. And 
you know, and again, it's, it's about, it's about getting them to get real. I had a, I worked on a case a couple of years ago and this case was about one thing and one thing only. The couple didn't really have very much in the assets. They had a lot of debt. The woman made a lot of money and the husband wanted $10,000 a month for the rest of his life in alimony. Now, some states are pro alimony states and some states aren't. So I live in Texas. Texas is not a particularly friendly to alimony state or spousal support. But this case was in California, which is probably the most generous state when it comes to spousal support. Now, the guy wanted $10,000 a month because he felt entitled, okay, to that because his wife made a lot of money. She was a physician and he felt entitled because he was married to her for 20 plus years. He wasn't a stay at home dad. He didn't raise the family. She raised the family. She was the breadwinner. He took care of the money and all they had was debt. So he didn't do a really good job of taking care of the money. But, you know, I didn't think his request was realistic. So I went and I talked to two attorneys and got their opinion. What do you think? Now, the two attorneys gave me two different opinions, but none of them agreed that he was entitled to $10,000 a month. Uh, and I told him, you need to go get an attorney's opinion. You need to talk to somebody else and find out if this is realistic. Because in your mind, it's realistic, but you got to get real. And so he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it because he didn't want to hear that he wasn't being realistic. And, you know, I told him at that point, I said, I really can't work with you if you're not willing to take, take my advice. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> it was only a mediation. It wasn't about financial planning. It wasn't the typical work I do. In a typical work, we look at all the assets, all the liabilities, and then we talk about who wants what. Because I might want the house, and my husband might might want the retirement plan, and you know we we need to understand what each party wants and what's realistic. And the thing most people have their marital home is the biggest asset they have. And in today's world, that is much more complicated than it was one or two years ago because the interest rates have gone up. So now you have to look at who's going to stay in the marital home or are you guys going to sell it? And if one party wants to stay, they need to understand, A, you've got to get a new mortgage and it's probably going to be at 7% as opposed to the old one, which is at 3%. You got to finance it at the current market rate. So if you got a mortgage, you know, ten years ago and your house was worth five hundred thousand, it might be worth a million now. So you have to finance it at a million at a seven percent, and you got to qualify on your own. So can you qualify on your own? Can you afford the payments? Because things have changed drastically. So it's it it's a lot of financial planning that would go into it. You also have to understand if you sell the house. There are tax ramifications if you've got a lot of equity. I'm working with a client right now, bought her house 30 years ago for $100,000. Now it's worth over a million. So you've got close to a million in equity that has to be split. And you got to understand what that means for both parties. So it's it can get very complicated. But the important thing is that people need to understand the decisions they're making today affect the rest of their life. And they need to understand what those are before they make the final decision. So when someone approaches you to start the conversation, is there any like common advice or tools that you find yourself using to help get them ready and prepared? A tools I use for financial planning. The only difference between this is we're dividing the financial plan in two. So it's, you know, Gathering all the documents and getting everything and is probably the, the hardest part, you know, because people usually don't have those things readily available. They have to go find them. They have to get them in there. You have to look at tax returns. You have to look at, you know, what each party's making. You have to look at what their investment accounts look like, what their retirement accounts look like. The other thing that they need to understand, because I deal a lot with older people or what's called gray divorce, which is divorce after the age of 50, 
these are people that have accumulated maybe 20, 30, 40 years of assets together, and now they got to split it up. And what's their life going to look like? So the budget is important. Make sure that you're on a, you can afford your lifestyle post-divorce. So there's a lot of financial planning and tax planning that goes into how to divide the assets. It can be really difficult too, because if they are not happy with each other and it's not a good situation, they might not be forthright in wanting to share things that they have or maybe not shared with their spouse. Or if the spouse, yeah. if the wife hasn't been a part of the financial plan, it could be a surprise to her. Yeah. So there are ways to get at that information, but Fortunately, I haven't run into too many situations where money's hidden. And, and the work that we do is so, it, it's pretty hard to hide those things because you're looking at credit card statements and bank statements and you're really, you're really understanding the money flow. So things with, like that um, may come up. And people get confused on who to use in these situations. And lawyers are not always a good guide for this situation. I have a client who this is post-divorce. So this came up after the divorce, but she realized her husband hadn't disclosed everything that he should have disclosed when they were going through the divorce. And so now she has to go back to court and she was told to hire a forensic accountant. And I told her, you do not need a forensic accountant. She actually already did the work that the forensic accountant would do. So if she hired one, she'd be, she'd be wasting her money on hiring somebody to do the work she already did. And that stuff happens all the time. I, I, I see a lot of attorneys a lot of times don't know what to do. So they send their clients on the wrong path and it costs them money. And I, I, I'm going to tell you a, a situation that happened a couple of years ago, but Guy calls me up and he says, I have a lawyer. My wife has a lawyer and we're, and it's January and we're planning to go to mediation in February. And, and in the context of the conversation, he tells me, we just want to split everything 50, 50. I said, well, why are you going to mediation? If you know that you want to split everything 50, 50. And his answer was because my lawyer said so. And I said, well, you're going to, waste money and time going through mediation and you're not going to come out any further ahead than you are today. And the reason that the attorney said that is the two attorneys couldn't agree. And the reason they couldn't agree, they didn't know how to split the assets. The guy had a lot of RSUs, which are restricted stock units, and they all had different price points and they all had different vesting schedules. And they needed financial and tax planning. They didn't need mediation. And so the lawyer didn't know what to do. So that's what he suggested. And in today's world, that would have cost him close to $24,000 to go to mediation because the lawyers wanted to go. You got to pay the lawyers. You got to pay the mediator. And they wouldn't have come out any different than they currently were because that's not what the problem was. They needed education. They needed you to step in and help them understand the RSUs and what they needed to do to untangle and get yeah. to where they could be 50-50 and do the tax planning. Now, a lot of your job is, is dealing with the money, but there's an emotional aspect to this whole process. How do you like remain sympathetic or empathetic while being real realistic with your clients? Because it can get very emotional. It, it can get it very terse. It can be difficult, but you got to understand... Um, that everybody has a bias and it's really important to leave your bias at the door because the way I look at it and I approach everything this way, it has to be a win-win for both parties. You got to look at it for nobody's going to get a hundred percent of the pie. And is it going to be a 60, 40 split a 50, 50 split a 55, 40 split split? It really depends. It depends. But I think what's really important, and I use this a lot, I use numbers to justify a lot of my recommendations. So I look at the budget. I look at the budget after post-divorce. Can this party afford it? I worked with a couple a couple years ago. He made $130,000. She made $30,000. Big gap 
in what they were making. And they had one child that was under the age of 18. He was going to be spending 26 days of the month with the mom. So now she's got the responsibility of herself, but also her child and a huge gap in how much money she can make versus her husband. And is it really a 50, 50 split fair in that, that, you know, situation? I don't think so. I mean, obviously I have biases, but you know, it's, it's, it's important to try to keep your personal biases out of the conversation as much as possible. Well, you saw my head shake like that doesn't sound fair to me, but yeah. again, but I'm talking about bias. What I try to do with anybody I'm working with is what's fair, what's fair in this particular situation. And, and if I find that the mom is going to have the kids most of the time and the mom's got a budget where she's got, you know, say $7,000 a month is what she needs and she can only bring it in five. There's a $2,000 gap in her budget. I got to look at how I can maximize the investments so that she's got dividend and income investments filling that gap. That becomes so really much. part of the negotiation process. It's like when you can show the other party, hey, your wife or your soon-to-be ex-wife can't live on this can we give her more of the assets? You know, that's just the way I approach it. I try to approach it as logically as possible. Well, when you take the emotion out of yourself and you're not bringing in your own biases and you break it down that way, it does make you more of a trusted advisor because you're not taking one side over the other. You're balancing it by showing them on paper, this is the reality. This is what you're looking at. What can we do? Yeah. But that's that's part of the challenge in financial services that sometimes people make emotional decisions when it needs to be more logical and rational. Like people get out of the market at the wrong time because they're scared and they should have stayed in or go in at the wrong time because it's at an all-time mm -hmm. high. So you've got to take the emotion out of it. We all make emotional well, decisions. Every decision we make is emotional. We just justify it with rational, <laughs> rational thinking. <laughs> Very true. If somebody was thinking, if somebody listening to this podcast today was thinking about potentially ending their marriage, what three things would you offer as the first three things they should do before making any decisions? I think you need a guide to help you in the emotional, the legal, and the financial. I think that's that's important. Now, it could be in, let's take emotional. You could get a therapist or you might have a a support group, or you might have a good friend. It's just whatever you choose, whatever helps you get through it, because it is a highly emotional time. And you'll have some days that are calm and some days that you're off the wall. But it it is an emotional journey. And you really need somebody who's going to guide you through that. The, the legal, you do need a legal person. You don't always need a legal person day one but you do need a legal person and everybody when they hire that attorney in their journey varies from case to case. So I, I tend to deal with people before they've hired attorneys and I help them find the right attorney when the time is right. And I try to, I try to do as much as possible without attorneys and then turn it over to the attorney. That's not always feasible. So I got a call from a woman last week who was scared that her husband was going to be violent, she needs an attorney right away. She might need me down the road, but day one, she needs an attorney. That doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen from time to time. Then I was working with a client who they only had, the couple been married 30 years. They had a lot of equity in their home, but the husband went and hired an attorney and told the attorney that his wife was going to pay for his attorney fees. That never happens ever. And so she now found herself in a situation where she, because he did that, she had to do that. They were trying to sell the marital home. He was living in it and it would make it difficult for people to come to see the house. So it wasn't getting sold. So that was a situation where she needed to bring an attorney earlier in the game. But again, everybody's journey is different and everybody brings in a lawyer at a different point in time. Now you can bring in a lawyer day one but I'm going to tell you right now, that's going to be the most costly way to do it. 
It's going to take the most time. And it creates an not a very amicable situation because if you hire an attorney, your husband feels that he's going to hire an attorney. And now the two attorneys are going to try to get the best for each party. Whereas when we sit down together, we come up with what I'd like to consider a win-win scenario. Understanding what each party wants and how it's how to divide the assets fairly. So what I'm hearing you say is first take care of your emotional health, whether that's through a therapist, having a rock or a best friend. Take care of your finances and find someone like yourself who can be basically a neutral party to help them understand what they have and what direction they can go. And then bring in the legal side of things at the right time. Right. 80% of the people, the, the cases that I see, they don't need a lawyer right away. There's always that 20% that does. It's usually when there's violence, there's fear of their life. Or I had a situation a couple of years ago where two people were in business together and the guy was blowing up the business because he didn't want to pay child support. Or there's situations where you need a restraining order or you need temporary child support, then you need a lawyer. This is pretty heavy. I mean, this you're dealing with a lot when going through divorces. So may I ask you, how do you balance? I mean, you, do you have a routine to keep your own sanity? Do you, what do you do to balance yourself in this line of work? Yeah. So you'll laugh when I tell you this. There's two, two things. I walk a lot. So I usually start my mornings with a, uh, with a half an hour walk. And that just clears my head. And then at the end of the day, I will go play. I'm a competitive Mahjong player. So I'll go online and play Mahjong because it you have to be really focused. And it kind of gets all the work stuff out of the out of my head. And now I'm focused on, you know, playing a game. <laughs> well, I'm glad you have an outlet. And as we're <laughs> wrapping up, because you have you really, I mean, this is a lot of information and you've had an eclectic career. I mean, you've gone through several iterations of your career path, and I can tell that you've got passion about what you're doing. Oh, yeah. What kind of advice would you give a woman who has an eclectic past like yourself but wants to get into financial services? What words of wisdom would you give them? Well, I will tell you, and and I do a lot of I do a lot of mentoring work for my alma mater. And so I talk to a lot of undergrads at the business school at Michigan State University, which is where I got my MBA. And they always ask me this question, you know, if you were going to give me any advice, what advice would you give me? And it's the same is get a mentor, get a mentor who, who can help you. Because I will tell you, I haven't had a lot of mentors in my life. And when I've had them, it makes things a lot smoother and it, and it could come from anywhere in your life. It doesn't even have to be somebody who is, you know, involved in your day-to-day. -day. It could be somebody in your personal life. But, you know, I think that if you could, like what, for example, when I started on this journey and I got into financial services, I was in the insurance side and I did everything myself. I learned everything myself and it was hard. But when I, I got my license to become a financial advisor, I knew that was even going to be harder. And I really wanted to find a mentor and did. And it made my life a lot easier. So I am a big proponent of being a mentor and helping people find mentors because I just think that that's so important in your career journey. I agree with you. Having a mentor is so important because not only do you learn from your mentor, your mentor learns from you. It's a symbiotic relationship where you can grow together and hopefully you stay the path and the course and you grow in your career. Amy, what you do to me is so fascinating, and I do appreciate everything you've shared with us. And before we wrap up, any final things you want to share before we? No, I just, I just think, you know, I, I, I encourage people, if you have assets or children, especially if there's assets, you really should engage a financial advisor in your journey because you really need to understand the financial and tax ramifications of the decisions that you're making today, because that affects your future. Amen. And Amy, thank you so much for being on here. And those of you who tuned in today, thank you for listening. And whatever you do with your day, make it a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to A Woman's Clarity, brought to you by C2P. 
an organization whose purpose is to educate, train, grow, and support holistic financial advisors so families can achieve true prosperity. Subscribe now and never miss an opportunity to learn how to become a more proactive, holistic advisor to the fast-growing female client base. Visit C2PEnterprises.com to learn how we can help support and enhance your business. At the time of delivery and any subsequent publishing, information was deemed reliable but is subject to change by the time of listening or viewing. The contents of this piece include options and projections of C2P, are subject to change, and are for informational purposes only. The information provided in this presentation is not intended to be individual investment, tax, or legal advice.